Now that we uh, have completed study, our study in the book of Genesis, I thought we would go back into the book of Romans, where we've been working through for a few years. And uh, by way of review, the first three chapters in Paul's magnificent letter to the Romans is about our is a diagnosis of the human condition. It's about our need for righteousness. All people are born sinners. We're, we're dying and we're facing judgment from God. All human beings, all descendants of Adam and Eve are in the same boat. No matter, no matter how you were raised, there is no real us in them. As far as sin goes, there's only us. We're all born in the same predicament. But then in verses chap- chapters 3 through 4, we hear about God's provision of righteousness, what we lacked, a right standing before God, what we could never get a hold of ourselves, God has provided for us in sending his son, who is fully God and fully man, to die on the cross in our place. And and we find here at the cross God's one-way love, that, that incredible thing that we call grace. And on the basis of Christ's death only, we're given a new cloak, a new jacket of Christ's righteousness to wear. We're given a new ID card. We're his now, and we're pronounced righteous. We say Christ's righteousness. His, all his perfection is imputed to us. It's put on our, we get credit for what Christ did in his life, and to this we contribute absolutely nothing. We only believe. Then we get to chapters 5 through 11, and, and Paul talks about all the benefits of of having Christ's righteousness given to us. We have peace with God. There's no condemnation, never any condemnation. God will never be mad at you, ever, if you're in Christ. You've been adopted as his son, his daughter. You're written into the will. You live in the hope of of living with a perfect body one day in a perfect new world. And God's love is just poured out upon us. Now, we get to chapter 12 and following, where we've been most recently when we look at Romans. And we learn about the lifestyle that goes with God's righteousness that's been credited to us. And for those who have been set free in Christ, Paul says, this is what life looks like. Now that you're in Christ, now that you're set free from the penalty of sin, from the lordship of sin, this is what life looks like. And the Christian life is, above all, it's a life of self-forgetfulness. We're not all turned in on ourselves because Through what Christ did for us, God is pleased with you. He accepts us. Uh, So it's a life of self-forgetfulness. We no longer are living to validate ourselves. Uh, There's no more pressure to win. Uh, We're no longer under the pressure to always get our own way or or to be better looking or to make more money than someone or to, to win more awards or to win every argument. We're free from all that stuff because we have everything we could ever need in Christ. Our value comes comes from Jesus. It's not from anything we accomplish. It's not based on comparing ourselves to other people. It's Christ alone. So now we get to chapter 13 verses 1 through 7 and you may wonder well how does this relate to the gospel? I mean Paul starts talking about how we need to respect, obey our government authorities but as we go along we're going to tie this in to the gospel. Remember what uh, Paul, you can open up your Bibles to Romans now. Uh, In chapter 12 Verses 1 and 2, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, because of what Christ has done for you, shedding his blood for you, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, transformed into thinking that Jesus Christ has given you, he's validated you, he, he's justified you. You don't need to look for that anywhere else, it's already yours. And because of that, then the rest of the, the book is, well, how you're supposed to live. And, and that includes showing love and respect to government authorities. So let's dive into chapter 13, verse 1, and he begins by saying, let every person, and he's thinking especially of Christians, be subject to the governing authorities. That's all human civil government. Yield to God's created order, he's saying, and therefore really yield to God's authority. So he says all those people, all those official government officials in your life, on the, on the national level or the local level, he says treat them, give them the proper respect as an act of worship to God himself. And it's very striking that Paul is writing to Christians who live 
in the Roman Empire when there was so, I mean, we have a lot of government corruption today, but I mean, what they had back then, I mean, the Roman Empire, there was so much corruption and horrible cruelty and oppression of people. A lot of the authorities were becoming more and more hostile to Christianity. In a few years, Nero would start killing Christians. And yet he, he still says anyway, respect the government authorities. And then he explains more about why in the middle of verse 1, he says, for there is no authority except from God. What he's saying is that God sets up the rulers over us. Uh, he sets up rulers and kingdoms according to his own purposes. For example, and you don't have to turn there, but there's a couple of verses in the book of Daniel where, where God speaks to Daniel, and Daniel says to, the, to King Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon. Now, Babylon was no democracy. Babylon, they, did, they didn't like you, they killed you. They did some really bad things, and this is what Daniel says. You, O king, he said, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the might, and the glory. And notice he says, he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, God's given you the might and the power and the glory. You rule because God has put you here. And he says, and then later says, God has made you, Nebuchadnezzar, ruler over all everybody else. And then in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel says, the Most High, God, rules the kingdoms of men and gives it to whom he will. If anybody has political power, it's because God has given it to them. Think of what Jesus said when he was standing before Pontius Pilate. And, and, and you know, Pontius Pilate was a delegated authority. He was a Roman governor over, over, over the Judah. And he's speaking, and G people are accusing Jesus, and he says nothing. And, and Pilate's amazed, and he says, he says do, you, do you not say anything to me? Don't you realize that I have power to set you free or to crucify you? Don't you know who I am? And Jesus looks at this powerful man and says, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. He says, Pilate, you have a lot of power, it's true, but it's, it's given to you by God. It's not something inherent in you. See, all, of, all God's authority is all, it all comes, gover I should say government authority, whether it's big on the national level or whether it's just on the local level, all government authority comes from God's authority. Well, he says more at the end of verse 1. Paul writes, and those that exist, those powers that exist, have been instituted by God. So Paul's applying what he just said to their immediate situation. The Roman emperor Nero was appointed by God. And all the lesser officials have a, a kind of a God-given authority. And, and this is something, you know, our Declaration of Independence says, governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, you know, biblically, I don't think that really holds up. It's not, it's not the consent of the government. It's, it's all authority comes from God. He goes on in verse 2 and says, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So to rebel against national or state or local government authority is, in a sense, to rebel against God's established order. Uh, which is like a rebellion against God. And what that means is that Barack Obama and Governor Tom Wolf, and if you're a resident of Harmony Borough, Kathy Rape, our mayor, or our local police chief, Jim Miller, all have been put into their positions by God for his reasons. We, we may not understand, but God has his reasons. And they exercise a God-delegated authority, whether they realize it or not. If, if, if someone has power, they do, like Pilate, for Pontius Pilate, he had authority because God gave it to him. It's, he, and Pilate perhaps did not ascribe the authority to God at all. But it doesn't matter where you, whether a person recognizes it or not. If they have authority, it's a God-given authority. God put them into that position. Now, this does not mean that God approves of all government behavior. This does not mean that God endorses tyrants or that God approves of corruption, and it doesn't mean you can't enter into the political process and work for change, but it does mean that God sets things up the way he wants to. There's a story about a, a couple that had a, a son who was in his early 20s 
who was living at home with him, and they weren't sure if he was really pursuing a, a career or anything, so they, they, they decided they would tr- come up with a test to try to figure out what he was meant to do. And so they, they took a, a $10 bill, a Bible, and a bottle of whiskey and put it on the, the table in the front ho- entry hall of their house. And the father said, listen, let's, let's, he and his wife went into a closet and they hid and they were just peeking through a, a keyhole. And they said, if our son takes the money, it means he'll be a businessman. If, if he takes the Bible, it means he'll be a preacher. But if he takes the whiskey, it means he'll be a drunk. Let's hide and see what he does. So they go and they, they're, in, they're hiding in the closet, looking through the keyhole, nervously waiting. And then the son finally comes home. He walks in the door and he walks over and stands in front of the table. He looks at it, he picks up the $10 bill, and he holds up to the light to see if it's authentic. Then he, then he opens the Bible and flips through it. Then he opens the bottle of whiskey and smells it to see what quality it was. And then he takes the Bible and the $10 bill and the whiskey, and he goes up, takes them all three of those things upstairs to his room. And the father slaps himself on the forehead and says, Oh, this is terrible. Our son's going to be a politician. <laughs> politics gets a bad rep, and maybe rightly so. There's a lot of corrupt officials, always has been. But what Paul is saying here in our passage today is that you're obligated to follow the laws of your country and your state and your town. God rules the world through sinners. The only time you can disobey government is when they specifically command you to do something that goes directly against God. I mean, if, the, if, if a government official says you can't tell anyone about Jesus anymore, you can't read your Bible, or you can't meet for worship, you certainly are free to disobey a lower law to keep a higher law of God. But that, that conflict happens sometimes. But generally, he's talking about the way things generally go. And, and he reemphasizes in verses 3 and 4 that God has appointed government authority to preserve society. Verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, But to bad, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Now, people in authority do bad things to good people sometimes, but he's talking about the way things are generally set up. Now, Paul's not naive. I mean, if you just read that, you might think, Paul, are you crazy? But Paul wasn't crazy. He was very aware of government corruption. I mean, Paul himself, you think of Acts 16, where he's arrested without a trial, he's beaten and thrown in prisons, all illegally. I mean, Paul is painfully aware of government corruption. And, and, and abuses of, of human rights. And Paul eventually would appeal all the way up to Caesar because he was being persecuted by corrupt lower courts. Jesus was crucified because of false charges against him. So we here, Paul is stating God's intent in sanctioning government and describing the way things are generally supposed to work. Verse 4, he says, For he the government official, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God. He calls him a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. And what you see here is there's two purposes of government that are described here. At the end of verse 3 and the beginning of verse 4, we see that the government is supposed to promote or foster virtue, promote what is good. And then in the beginning of verse 3 and the end of verse 4, the government is supposed to restrain evil. And I often think that in our country, we probably put more effort into number two, restraining evil, and, and I'm not so sure what we do with number one. Now, listen, I'm no statesman. I'm not running for office. I'm no sociologist. But I think there's some, there's some issues in our country that need to be addressed. Like, I, I don't understand why you, you pay a tax penalty if you're married. I mean, I don't get that. You think the government should promote marriage. And, and I don't understand why people who work hard to save money sometimes get less financial aid for school than people who may have squandered their money. I mean, I, I don't get that. And, and we put so much effort into protecting the rights of people who have done things, who've made immoral choices, but almost nothing is done by the government, as I see it, to reward virtue. Now, I know part of the problem is nowadays in our society, it's hard to get everyone to even agree on what is right and wrong, on, on what is virtue. But it seems that what Paul is saying is that what the government is supposed to do, ideally, is to reward hard work, reward chastity, 
and sacrifice and commitment to family. But there's also something else that troubles me, is that in our country they say three out of every 100 Americans, that's 3%, are either on probation, parole, or behind bars. And I think that's the highest reported rate in, in the world. And, and uh, now I know there's, people you got, there's some people you've got to lock up. There's people who are violent and you've got to lock them up. But I wonder if, if we're missing something here. I heard someone on KDKA say that 90% of those in jail are often tangled up in drugs or alcohol. Maybe, maybe government needs to take a look at preventing some things before they happen. Again, I'm no statesman, I'm no, I'm no sociologist, but maybe we don't always look at the right things. Now something else I want to just point out here quickly is there's an important difference between personal revenge and God-sanctioned justice. If you look back at chapter 12, verse 19, uh, Paul said, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. We are never to take personal revenge, but Romans 13, verses, verse 4, talks about how, how God government, God's sanctioned government does carry the sword, can, can restrain evil. Vengeance belongs to God. He often chooses to work through courts of law, even though they are very imperfect, sometimes by direct intervention. And this does not mean government's always just. It certainly is not. God works through sinners. But it is only for government to, to bring about justice, not, not for individuals to be trying to get revenge. Well, Paul kind of puts, puts it all together in verses 5 through 7 and says you need to respect government officials even if you detest their policies, we are still to respect them as God's servants. Verse 5, therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Just follow the law of the land. Not only to avoid fines or, or jail time, but also because of conscience. Because as a Christian, you want to be known as someone who, who loves their neighbor, who shows respect who's not trying to be a, a rabble-rouser or, or trying to see how many laws they can get away breaking. But we're to be peaceful people. Verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. You ever hear about the politician that began his speech? He said, Ladies and gentlemen, please let me tax your memories for just a moment. And someone from the back called out, why don't you go ahead and tax our memory? You've taxed everything else. Why don't you try taxing our memories? We get, I hate tax. Taxes drive me crazy. Everyone's always looking for new taxes. I know it drives me crazy. Probably drives you crazy. But what Paul says is as believers, we should pay taxes because we're supporting God's servants, even though a lot of them don't even know or care that they're God's servants. That's how God views them, even though they're sometimes very corrupt. Sometimes they don't have the slightest idea what they're doing. But we, he says... Pay your taxes. Uh, you know, in a, we're in a fallen world, you got to have government. You have to do it. You remember, this is, you know, the Leaning Tower of Pizza is, is called the Leaning Tower of Pizza because it leans. I think about 20 years or so, the, the, the government in, in Italy decided they had, they had to do something. The 12th century landmark was starting to tilt more and more and more and more. And so what they did is they injected super cold liquid nitrogen into the ground and they froze it to freeze the, the, the foundation around the ground around the tower and so that it would minimize the dangerous ground vibrations during the work that followed. And then the plan was to install some kind of cables to help keep the Leaning Tower of Pisa just a little bit more upright so it wouldn't keep leaning, leaning until it would finally fall on the ground. And maybe only pulled it back an inch, but that was at least going in the right direction. You know, our world is like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Because of sin, we're always, things are always prone to degenerate. And to prevent total anarchy, God establishes governments to maintain order. Some governments do that better than others. But, but anarchy, no government at all. It's tempting to say if we got rid of all government, things would be better. In a fallen world, you've got to have some government. The idea of anarchy gets no support in the Bible. You look at parts of Mexico where, where the, the, the government is impotent. You know, the drug lords are just controlling the whole country. And, and, and anarchy turns into looting. We see what happens when there's a, national, uh, a natural disaster and people start looting and just ripping a town apart. Um, conservatives want smaller government. Liberals want a bigger government. But either way, you've got to have some kind of government 
because we live in a fallen world. And so you've got to pay taxes. Whether you, even though you may hate it, you've got to pay taxes. Verse 7, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Remember, he's writing this during the days of the Roman Empire, and there is some really bad, evil, corrupt government officials. And, and certainly later on in the book of Acts, sometimes the apostles will disobey the government when they tell them they can't preach about Jesus. But generally the principle is you submit to these servants of God. You know, in Mark, Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, Caesar, Caesar's. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. See, why can't I say that? I must be thinking of Tom Seaver, the, the famous Mets hurler. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. There are legitimate obligations to Caesar. So as citi- we're Christians, right, as citizens of the USA, probably Pennsylvania, Butler County, and your town, you pay certain kind of taxes. Uh, you, you show different forms of respect to various levels of God-ordained authorities. Uh, to our local mayor, it's more of a first-name basis informal respect. Uh, to the police chief or to our governor, to the president of the United States, it's more of a, a formal respect. You fasten your seatbelt. You drive under the speed limit because God has placed those things in for the benefit of society. Now, what we need to do is talk a little bit about well, what, what does all this have to do with the gospel? Why, why is Paul writing to Christians, right, who've been saved through faith alone and Christ alone? Why is he telling us, why is he putting that here in the book of Romans that's all about the gospel? Oh, I mean, you may even ask, well, haven't, haven't we been saying here, hasn't Paul been teaching that we're, we're justified and accepted by Christ only? We're not made right with God by keeping the Ten Commandments or by driving under the speed limit, right? That doesn't save us. So why is he talking to us about government? Well, I think it really does relate to the gospel. And I, let me tell you what I think is going on here. Everything you need, and what Paul's been teaching throughout this long letter, is everything you need, you already have in Christ because of what he's done for you, what he's done for me. His Christ's righteousness, Christ's value, his importance, his position, his goodness has all been credited to you by faith in Christ. All your sins are removed forever and ever. The memory of them is gone. And, and you share in Christ's position, seated at the right hand of the Father. I mean, that you have his righteousness. There's, you don't need anyone but Christ. So God himself guarantees that you are a co-heir with Jesus Christ of God's coming kingdom. Jesus even promises in the Gospels that when we get together for the big wedding feast, the great glorious celebration in the future and the resurrection, Jesus Christ will personally come and wait on you hand and foot around that table. He will, the, the king of kings will wait on you. I mean, God's provided everything for us. It's, it's incredible. So because of this, you can't have it any higher position than you have in Christ. The, the, the kingdom you will be part of, the work you'll do in that kingdom, it couldn't be any better or more wonderful, more glorious. So because of this, you're now free, and I, we're all free now to give our lives to others and serving others, doing what's best for others, doing what's best for our country and our state and our county and our community. We're no longer curved in on ourselves because God is pleased with us. We're part of the family. You don't have to worry about getting that somehow so we can just do things that are good for other people. So I think what Paul's saying is that as we realize uh, that we can never be denied our heavenly place. Nothing can deny us that. Nothing will deny our heavenly authority, which Jesus purchased for us with his own blood. We become more willing to serve our current earthly authorities in love, even though they, they can be corrupt, even though they are sinners like us. We obey earthly laws to better respect others, to be helpful to others. Galatians 5.13, you don't have to turn there. Galatians 5.13, Paul says, use your freedom in Christ to serve one another. So this passage that we're looking at this morning is about loving your neighbor. Things are already good for us vertically with God through faith in Christ, and if that's true, we can now serve other people on the horizontal level. See, this passage is, a, is meant to be understood as a byproduct. It's, it's, if God, think about how God 
what God told the Jewish people. Uh, when they were going to be carried off and were being carried off to Babylon, God said, look, you're going to be there for 70 years. I don't want you to be trying to overthrow the Babylonian government and leading a revolution or an insurrection. I want you to work for the good of that country. Yeah, they, there's a lot of things wrong with them, but I want you to pray for your leaders in Babylon since you're going to be there. Uh, look at the screen at Jeremiah 29, verse 7. And this is what God's people are told. But seek the welfare of the city, you know, Babylon, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. Pray for God to do good things in Babylon. He doesn't say, oh, those crummy pagans, just overthrow them and come home. He says, no, you're going to be there for a while. Work for the good of that society. And the reason for that is found in verse 11. We'll put that on the screen now. Look what he says to the Jewish people. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, look, he says to the people, I've made promises to your, you know, your ancestor Abraham. I am going to bless you like I said. I'm going to bring you back. In my good time, I'm going to bring you back to the Holy Land, and I'm going to bless you there. Because I'm going to do that for you, you can be confident of that. You don't have to be working to overthrow the Babylonian government. You can work for the good of the people around you, serve your neighbor, pray for the people around you, even the corrupt government officials. He's pray for them because God says to the people of Israel through Jeremiah, I, you can be so sure that I will bring you home at the right time. You don't have to be working and involved with, with, with revolutions and, and assassinations and devi uh, devious activity. I will bless you when I decide to do it. It's all going to work out fine. And that's what God says to us in Christ. It's all going to work out fine. You're going to be part of the kingdom that never ends, so you can focus on doing what's good for others. Now, spending your life angry at the government is a heavy, burden-filled way to live. And listen, listen, I, I've done it. There are times I just complain, I moan. Why do they, why do they, who is this idiot in the office? Why don't I do that? I mean, I understand that. It's very, people in government are very, very frustrating. I mean, I can't, I can't understand how I can't even figure out how to do my own taxes. You'd think they would figure out how you can f understand to do your own taxes. I used to do my taxes. I'd mail them in, and they'd, they'd mail me a letter back and say, you did it wrong. I'd write a letter back and say, no, I didn't. I did fine. And in the early 90s, they would let that go. But then I started getting calls. When, I, when they said, no, listen, they, one guy called. I've told you this story before. I said, I, this guy named Mike from Philadelphia called. He said, Pastor, you need to do these a couple things that are wrong here. And I said to him, how come, I mean, what's going to happen? I, mean, I can't even understand my taxes. What's going to happen in the future in, in doing these taxes? They're so complicated. I don't understand them. And, and the guy said to me, Reverend, only the Lord knows. He said, Reverend, only the Lord can understand how the tax code works. And it's, it's frustrating to me why they can't even just make things that are easy to understand. But you know, we are to pay our taxes. Even if it takes you three or four tries. If you go to an accountant, you've got to pay your taxes. We have to respect the people in authority. And you want to know something? If, if Christians took over this country, we'd still have a lot of problems because we'd still have sinners in office. Maybe things would be better, I hope. But still, we'd still have, and people would disagree and people would argue and sometimes be nasty. I mean, politics is nasty business. There's so much vitriol, so much mudslinging. It's been that way for a long time. It's a, it's a heavy way to live. I mean, politicians that get their assistants to go and dig up dirt on other people. What a terrible way to live, digging up dirt on other people. It's good that it's fine to have opinions. It's fine to have strong political opinions. It's fine to express those strong political opinions. It's fine to talk about it. It's fine to even use satire. It's appropriate. But we must never disrespect people. We must, never, we must never trash talk people in authority. And I know I've done it. I've, I admit I've done it. But we must not trash talk. Sure, you can disagree with a policy and argue against it. It may be a very poor policy. But we can't demonize other human beings. There's a story about a, a woman who was trying to get her mule to move, but her mule was too stubborn. And so she went inside the farmhouse and she came out with a baseball bat. And she, sw and she hit that mule upside the head with the bat. And finally, the, the, the mule started to move. And, and, and the woman's daughter said, Mom, why'd you hit the mule over the head with the bat? And Mom said, because you got to do something to get his attention. Maybe that may work with a mule. I don't know. I don't have much experience with that. 
But I tell you something, when you hit a human being in the side of the head and you don't respect them, you're not creating much of an opening for the gospel. When we trash talk other people, and, and, and people, they, they hear what's being said, we, we do not create open hearts for the gospel. Now, if you need to disagree, it's fine to disagree, but when we, when we denigrate people or we are so disrespectful to them as a human being, that doesn't get us very far. A life of freedom in Christ is being able to even bless those who persecute you. Jesus taught us that. Uh, look at the screen at 1 Peter chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 9. Peter writes, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. We could say insult for insult. But on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. You see what he's saying? He said, you were called to faith in Christ. You already have the blessing. You've already in a, positionally been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Your future is guaranteed. You are blessed as, as the member of Christ's royal court. You inherit the greatest kingdom that's ever been. That's already yours. That you've, you will, that's your blessing. So because we're blessed, because we've received vertical blessing from God, we're now able horizontally to bless, to say good things, helpful things to other people. You can disagree with people. You can be disappointed by people. You still can speak good things, and hopefully that includes the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, thank, we praise you that you saved us. We were sinners, Father. We were under the condemnation of the heavenly court. And apart from government, we were under your judgment. We were dying and, and facing your wrath. But you say, you, you sent Jesus. Your, your son, the, the God of very God, took on human nature and, be, and lived with us and ate our food and shared our trials and our tears and our suffering. And then all our sins were charged to him like he were a criminal. And he died in our place. And Father, and then you raised them from the dead. You accept the sacrifice. And, and you did that for us. We, did, we didn't contribute a thing. I pray that every one of us here would believe on the Lord Jesus and receive this.